Jinnah is a telling example of the individual interacting with an amorphous Muslim collectivity. Prior to 1926, he had been the leader of the independent party in the Central Legislative Assembly, holding the balance between the government and the Congress. Dr. Jalal argues that Jinnah's transformation from a proponent of Hindu-Muslim unity to the leader of the movement from Pakistan was driven by his acute understanding of the political landscape and the need to secure Muslim interests within a predominantly Hindu India. It was the Barelvis who ruled Jinnah a heretic. A kafir could not be qaid azam A more obnoxious pronouncement was that those supporting Jinnah ceased to be Muslims, their marriages were void, and so on. Maulana Hussain Ahmad Madni and Hafiz ur Rahman took turns in wishing hellfire on Jinnah for having no beard, for not fasting during Ramzan, and for frequenting clubs and cinemas instead of saying his prayers. Nawab Bahadur Yarjang and Abdul Sattar Niazi, who wanted to commit the All India League to basing Pakistan on Quranic principles. As a politician and a constitutionalist, Jinnah knew that there could be no accommodation of cultural differences which borrowed its rationale from the self-proclaimed guardians of Islam. Pragmatic to the core, he was not prepared to let the shock slogan or stunt value of Pakistan get shattered by ideological or sectarian differences amongst Muslims. By adopting the logic of inclusion, not exclusion, Jinnah gave breadth to the League's notion of citizenship rights. There were several initial attempts by some Muslims to situate themselves within mainstream Indian nationalism. One individual who deserves a special mention in this respect is Muhammad Ali Jinnah, a Bombay-based lawyer with an uncommon aversion to all forms of Islamic orthodoxy. Firmly on the side of moderate nationalists in the Congress such as Gokhale, Jinnah was the only Muslim voice of repute that had opposed the separate electorates. More cosmopolitan than communitarian in outlook, Jinnah's career exemplifies the constant reconfiguring of the balance between the individual and community in Islam. Starting on the outer margins of the Muslim community, Jinnah negotiated his space in India by becoming the ambassador of Hindu-Muslim unity and then reconstituting himself as the foremost individual protagonist of the Muslim League's two-nation theory. His break with the Congress came on the question of Khilafat and non-cooperation. As a moderate constitutionalist, he was opposed both to the use of an emotive religious issue such as the Khilafat, as well as the break with constitutional means he had been so committed to. Jinnah is a telling example of the individual interacting with an amorphous Muslim collectivity. Prior to 1926, he had been the leader of the independent party in the Central Legislative Assembly holding the balance between the government and the Congress. His shift from this role to a communitarian was gradual but decisive. Jinnah's articulation of the two-nation theory, which posited Muslims and Hindus as distinct nations, was, according to Dr. Jalal, a tactical response to the failure of securing adequate safeguards for Muslims within the Indian National Congress-dominated framework. He sought a political arrangement that would ensure Muslims had an equal stake in governance. Dr. Jalal also highlights Jinnah's use of the press and public forums to build support for his vision, demonstrating his skill in mobilizing mass support and negotiating with both the British colonial authorities and Indian political leaders. Dr. Jalal argues that Jinnah's transformation from a proponent of Hindu-Muslim unity to the leader of the movement from Pakistan was driven by his acute understanding of the political landscape and the need to secure Muslim interests within a predominantly Hindu India. Dr. Jalal contends that Jinnah's demand for Pakistan was not initially about creating a separate nation-state, but about achieving greater political leverage and safeguarding Muslim Muslim autonomy within a federal structure. Nevertheless, he was not without his critics in the Muslim community, who attacked him for being too westernized and irreligious. Periodic fatwas against Jinnah point to a fierce struggle over Islam, both as a religion and a way of life. A bevy of ulama objected to the League's leadership's westernized outlook and disregard for Islamic values. With antecedents dating back to the 19th century, Western-educated Muslims like Jinnah were locked in grim competition with those reared in madrasas and religious seminaries. Taking the lead, it was the Barelvis who ruled Jinnah a heretic. A kafir could not be qaid azam a more obnoxious pronouncement was that those supporting Jinnah ceased to be Muslims, their marriages were void, and so on. The Barelvis demanded declarations from Maulana Zafar Ali Khan, Nawab Ismail Khan, and others that Mr. Jinnah had no status other than an infidel barrister. Congress backed Ahrars and the Jamiyat e Ulama e Hind had been kicking up a storm about Jinnah's lack of a religious disposition. Maulana Hussain Ahmad Madni and Hafiz ur Rahman took turns in wishing hellfire on Jinnah for having no beard, for not fasting during Ramzan, and for frequenting clubs and cinemas instead of saying his prayers. Mazhar Ali Azhar noted that Jinnah, although a rich man, had never visited Mecca. He jeered at the leaguers with a couplet, Ek kafir ke Islam ko chhoda, ye azam hai, ye azam. 
translated as they left Islam for an infidel. Is this a great leader or a great infidel? Harar published several pamphlets attacking Jinnah for marrying a Parsi and for patronizing Ahmadis and communists. Regardless of whether anyone was convinced, they succeeded in forcing Jinnah and the League to make frequent uses of the Islamic idiom. Taking to wearing the Sherwani and a Karakul cap, Jinnah, despite his anglicized Urdu, did make a show of his Muslim cultural identity. Declaring his intention to take on the ulama, a breed for whom he had long harbored contempt, he told the All India Muslim League that Muslim India and the League had not yet become shockproof slogan-proof or stunt-proof. He was, however, unfazed by men like Nawab Bahadur Yarjang and Abdul Sattar Niazi, who wanted to commit the All India League to basing Pakistan on Quranic principles. As a politician and a constitutionalist, Jinnah knew that there could be no accommodation of cultural differences which borrowed its rationale from the self-proclaimed guardians of Islam. Pragmatic to the core, he was not prepared to let the shock slogan or stunt value of Pakistan get shattered by ideological or sectarian differences amongst Muslims. At his behest, the Muslim League resisted demands to oust the Ahmadis from the Muslim community. By adopting the logic of inclusion, not exclusion, Jinnah gave breadth to the League's notion of citizenship rights. Jinnah's pragmatic approach is evident in his efforts to maintain unity among Muslims, despite the sectarian controversies surrounding the Ahmadiyya community. He avoided taking a public stance on theological disputes and focused instead on the political and strategic benefits of including Ahmadis within the broader Muslim fold. This inclusivity helped to bolster the Muslim League's ranks and presented a united front against the Indian National Congress and British colonial authorities. Dr. Jalal notes that Jinnah's inclusive stance towards Ahmadis faced criticism from more orthodox Muslim groups such as the Majlis-e Ehrare Islam, who vehemently opposed the Ahmadis and questioned their Muslim identity. These tensions underscored the challenges that Jinnah faced in balancing the diverse and sometimes conflicting interests within the Muslim community.